Hello and welcome to the latest in the interview series on Back of the Net, where we have the chance to talk with AFC Bournemouth legends. Now, before we introduce this guest, let me first bring in Neil Dawson, who is standing by. Neil, Hi, how are you, mate? You all right? Yeah, very good, very good. Looking forward to this one immensely. Excellent. Me too. So, who is the Cherries legend that we have for you tonight? This time, we've got a player who many of us idolised for the two and a half seasons that he was with us. Moving from non-league, he made 62 appearances for the Cherries between 89 and 92, and then joined Aston Villa for £350,000, where he formed an outstanding partnership with Irish international Paul McGrath. He's a player who's been described as the most centre-half looking centre-half who ever lived, possibly got the biggest calves that some Cherries fans have ever seen. It is none other than Sean Teal. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hi, Neil. Yeah, very good. Welcome, Sean. How are you? You all right? Yeah, very good, thanks. Good. And how's this year been treating you? What have you been up to? Um, well, it's, it's not really changed for me. I've been out every day at work. Um, I'm a painter and decorator by trade, so... Uh, I've really had no days off. I think I had three days off at Christmas and that's been it for the last 12 months. Well, we're delighted you can join us. And um, both Neil and I remember your playing days with that, that season, I suppose you'd say. Um, <laughs> yeah. And very fondly too. But you actually started, didn't you? You're from Southport in Lancashire. So I am. Tell, tell us about your early football memories. How did you get into the game? Um, I joined a local YMCA uh, at the age of six, I was asked if I'd go along and play. Um, obviously, I was only a, a you know a baby at that time, um, and just really enjoyed it. And, and just from then on, I, I suppose I got bitten by the bug. All I wanted to do was play football, um, and it was it was a rocky road. It wasn't as, as straightforward as a lot of, of as a lot of pros are nowadays. You know, go to the academy, go through into young pros, and then become a full time pro. Uh, in my day, it was. It was schoolboy forms, then it was apprentice forms um, before you became a pro. Um, so mine was very up and down. I joined Everton at 15, um, got fired off at 17, not good enough, uh, into non-league. Um, seven, seven years later, finally became a pro uh, at 24. Your non-league appearances, they were for Southport, right? That was the Northern Premier League? <laughs> well, you could. <laughs> that, that's one team. Um, I mean, I started off, I think, Ellesmere Port when I first left Everton. Um, I did the usual thing in them days. I wrote to all the pro clubs asking for, for a trial, basically. Uh, I think I played for Wigan in one game. I played for Leeds in one game. Um, and then Huddersfield asked me if I'd play the rest of the season in their reserves. So that's what I did. I, I never trained. I just, I literally got, my, my dad drove me over to Huddersfield on a Saturday or a Wednesday. Played the game, went home, and that was it. Saw them at the next game, um, but it was a good grounding. You know, there were some good players. With, uh, 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 the one that stands out, funny enough, uh, all these years later, is playing Aston Villa twice in a week, um, and Dave Geddes broke my nose twice in a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have reminded him since, so uh, yeah. he doesn't remember it. So obviously, his memory is not as good as mine. You're not you're not a centre half till you've had your nose broken, though. It's a rite of passage, isn't it? So uh, yeah. when you the, the interesting move in that non-league thing was when you went from Southport to Weymouth. I mean, did you get lost in the car? How on earth did that happen? Uh, well, it, uh, again, it wasn't even Southport to Weymouth. It was Northwich Victoria to Weymouth. Oh, was it? Um, yeah, I, I'd uh, I'd should we say had a fallout with the manager at Southport. Um, he chipped my tooth and I pinned him up against the wall. Hence. I left. Um, yeah, no. Uh, so they sold me for they sold me for two and a half grand to, to Northwich Victoria, um, and one of my very first games for Northwich was down at Weymouth at, at the old stadium, the old ground in, in the in the town, um, and we were in desperate trouble. We were we were I think seven games to go, and we needed wins because uh, um, we were cut away at the bottom, and we ended up staying up. It was quite weird, um, and that was my first. Uh, involvement playing in a, a back three. I'd never played in a back. I'd never even played centre half at that stage in my career. I played left back all my career. Um, so I, I ended up playing centre back uh, of a three um, with an older player, uh, someone with more experience playing sweeper. And we went on to win more or less all those games and stayed up. 
Um, so I back there for, the, for pre-season, did pre-season, played three games, and then Weymouth came in for me. Um, it was quite a strange one because I, I got a phone call off the manager, Cliff Roberts, at, at Northwich, and he said, uh, there's a club coming for you. They've offered good money, 25 grand, actually, they'd offered, which in them days, a lot of money. Um, but Weymouth had sold the ground in, in the town, built built Raddy Pole Lane, as it is now. Uh, so they were, they were firing on all cylinders. So he sort of said to me, listen, I know it's not a league club and that's what you really wanted, blah, blah, blah. But do me a favour, listen to what they've got to say and then find out what they're offering you. Give me a bell back and I'll tell you whether to go or not. <laughs> so <laughs> I know, exactly. It's a bit of a strange one, really, because you expect the manager to either say, right, get lost, we want the money or stay because we don't want to sell you. Yeah. Um, but he was really fair about it. And that's the one thing that always stood out about Cliff, Cliff Roberts. So I phoned him back and I was on 40 quid a game at Northwich at the time. And uh, I phoned him back and he said, go on then, what, what have they offered you? I went, well, they've offered me 150 quid a week. He went, right. I said, they've offered me two grand signing on fee and a house to live in free. He said, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that was literally it. I went, I, I drove to Northwich the next day. Well, I got a lift to Northwich because I didn't drive at the time. I got a lift down to Northwich the next day, met Stuart Morgan, yeah. signed, and went straight to Boston uh, and sat in the stand because I wasn't el eligible to play anyway. But that was me, straight down to Weymouth after the game. You know, and wife wife and young kids left in Southport. So I spent 11 days in Weymouth while they sorted everything out. I trained, played a couple of games. Um they showed me around the house they were giving us to use. Uh, and it was just brilliant. The whole setup was fantastic. Uh, and by the time I'd left, I actually had a job as a painter and decorator with uh, a former player, Gary Borthwick. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden, I was earning 350 quid a week mm. from 40 quid a week. It was like, you know, th this is, th I thought, I thought I'd made it. <laughs> <laughs> I was on 350 quid a week and I, I, I had two grand in the bank. Yeah. And it took exactly. me four years to spend that two grand because I just didn't touch it. And and did I read, Sean, that you, you played England semi pro with an ex cherry, Paul Compton? Yeah, I played one game. Yeah, my, my, uh, it was the last international before I signed pro. Um, well, Compo was, my, Compo was my partner anyway at the back at, at Weymouth. So. Uh, me and Paul got on really well. You know, we still speak to this day. We're, we're, we're still friends. Um, I didn't upset him that much when I left. But, you know, um, yeah, Compo was great for me. Uh, a big strapping centre off. Uh, you know, yeah. I could I could sweep up behind him. Uh, I did have a bit of pace in them days. Um, and I, I just, the first year at, at Weymouth was, we have won the league, really. We, lo we lost the league on the new ground because it flooded. And we ended up playing nine games away on the bounce. And by the time we come back, I think we'd lost three of them or four of them, and Barnett had run away with it. Um, but yeah, I got my one, my one and only non-league cap, uh, and then I was off to I was off to Bournemouth. How did that move come about then? Because obviously Stuart Morgan was good mates <laughs> with Harry Redknapp, wasn't he? So I guess well, he would have put a word in. Yeah, there, there was a lot of a lot of things uh, were said years later that that Stuart sold Weymouth down the river with my deal. Um, and it was all to do with uh, Stuart being guaranteed a job with Harry at Bournemouth. Um, and it wasn't like that. It, I mean, whatever went on between Harry and Stuart, I never knew about. As far as I was concerned, it was, it was, uh, it was, was it 90 grand in total in the end? It started out as 50 and ended up as 90, I think. Um, and it was just the deal was done. Um, and the only thing really left for me to do was to, to, to get to Bournemouth uh, uh, and try and get the first team. Yeah. And you got into the first team probably quicker than you expected because Kevin Bond got a bit of an injury, mm -hmm. didn't he, that allowed you to break into the team? Yeah. Um, I, I, I my, my debut was against West Brom at, at Dean Court. I came on the sub late in the yeah. game. Um, I think we won one nil if I'm right. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed, I think it was my 15 minutes, I think I really enjoyed um, and then Kevin had this this hip injury where he desperately needed this operation where they took a piece of bone 
and inserted it in his hip joint, which meant he was going to be out the rest of the season. So, hence, I got the chance uh, and literally was just thrown in, get on with it. Um, but, you know, the old saying, duck to water came to mind. It, it just suited me, the, the whole, you know, the whole, the way the game was played. Um, my game suited suited the pro game at that level. And I just, you know, I settled in so quick and the lads were brilliant. People like Noose and, and Mozzie and, and John Williams, as we've already said, Bish. You know, we had, we had a really good squad in them days, to be fair. Um, and we probably didn't do as well as we should have. No. I mean, I remember, I don't know if you remember this. I was talking to my dad about this because I said the, you were coming on. Your The first thing you did when you came on against West Brom was you completely and utterly polacked someone and then came out with the ball. And the whole crowd, yeah. the whole, the whole crowd went mad. The whole Me? crowd went mad. And I thought, and if ever an introduction to a new player, I mean, you literally, you took someone out and then came away with the ball. And uh, and I think for a lot of fans that they were like, right, this, this lad will be all right. Was it... Did you have self-doubt? Because even if you're confident, stepping up from non-league into what's now the championship, did you did you have any doubts? No, no none whatsoever. Um, I, I'd, I'd push myself from getting released at Everton. I'd push myself and push myself. Um, I'd never questioned my own ability. That was the one thing I never questioned. Other people did, obviously. Howard Kendall, for one, he got rid of me. Um, and there would have been other managers down the line down the line. I went to I went to Liverpool on trial. I stayed at Liverpool 16 weeks when I was at Southport. Um, I went in every day. I got picked up by Mark Lawrenson every day and took in with Alan Hansen. I got lift home off Kenny Dalglish, who was the manager. Um, and they really looked after me. But Ronnie Moran didn't like me. And right. because Ronnie Moran didn't like me, they were never going to sign me. So I stayed 16 weeks in Southport because I was on contract. Southport would only allow me to play one game in the reserves. So I think I think they got fed up of waiting to see what I could do on the pitch, in a way, and and it just it, it fizzled out. Um, but no self, no, never had any self doubts. Right, right the way through my career, I've been. I, I, I'm not blasé about it. I never was. I was just quietly confident that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Even if sometimes I didn't quite know what I was doing, but you know, you blag it in the end of the day. Um, I think the, yeah. the the thing that used to impress press the fans was me as well is the the uh, the way that you you read the game really well. You tackled really uh, as Neil described. You know, full force tackling. Your sliding tackles were legendary. You had a really good left foot. I mean, you, you seem to have time, which a lot of centre halves. You, you kind of reminded me a bit of Steve Cook today. But a left footed version of him, you know, you're kind of 100%. And I think you had that really good balance with the, uh, can I say, the slightly slower Willow in that back four. I'll let you tell him that. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it kind of worked and gelled, you know. Yeah. Newsom was yeah. a really good ball player. Paul Morrell was a really good ball player. And and, uh -huh. and Willow was kind of like the, the sort of physical rock who'd pick up the big man, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly how it always used to pan out. You know, we're in the changing room before the game, Willow would be given his man, and and he'd literally, to be, to be fair, follow him everywhere. You know, because most teams played four four two anyway at that stage, so we both had a man to pick up, and yeah, you know, we we didn't get it waylaid in the in the crossing over of all that. You know, you stay in your own side most of the time, especially being naturally right and left footed. But um, yeah, for the most part, any free kicks, anything like that, Willow had the big man. Um, However, at the time, I mean, I think I think one of my biggest assets at the time was was my power in the air, my, my ability to jump and head, um, and it was just part of my game that I'd never really practiced. It was just it was a natural. It's a timey thing, I suppose. You know, you you either do time headers or you don't time it. You want to see me nowadays when I play with the vets. When the ball's coming, I'm on my way down before I've got up. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> you know, and and that's what you lose. You lose it in your legs. You lose your timing. Uh, I, my time at Bournemouth was uh, oh, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look like a swallow. I, I look like a swallowed a rat. <laughs> that's that's Mark Morris as well. It, um, it is as well. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say that. Um, I never I never played with Mark because obviously Mark came after I'd left. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, you know, um, that was that was uh, uh, typical me in them days, I suppose. Long hair, shaggy hair, and looking like a I've been dra dragged through a hedge backwards. So in terms of, um, we've had a few players on from that era who said it was a great team for a night out. Do you, did you have any great nights out? Who were the who were the best? Who were the best drinkers and who was the best company? Uh, no, because to be fair, the only time I went out with the, the lads in, in that time was we were <laughs> we went to Magaluf for right. a, an end of season break, um, and the first night there was, I think there was probably all of us in a big group together, and these. Uh, Spanish lads started gobbing off, uh, and next thing, one of them pulled a knife on us. <laughs> and it was like, "Oops, we'll give yeah. that one a miss." Um, but yeah, I mean that. To be fair, there were some drinkers: uh, Mozzie, Willow, yeah. Noose, Bish. Um, you know, they, then you had your same ones like Luther. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, no, uh, go, going out, going out while in and around Bournemouth. No, I don't think I ever did. Mm. I, I was I was a family man. I had, I had very young kids, and um, you know my time was spent with them, really. Yeah. And what about some of the players that you marked? Because I remember seeing you up against, I think it was Ian Wright in the Palace game. I think that's uh -huh, it. yeah. So yeah. there were some real quality strikers that you had to pick up, weren't there? Yeah, the, I mean the Ian Wright thing was quite sure because that was one of my early games. Um, and obviously it was it was the right and bright partnership and everybody was telling me on the coach how good they were and blah 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 but if i remember right it was a, uh, sellers park was was very wet very muddy um which suited my game anyway and didn't suit their movement so i i actually ended up in a more or less a free for all with righty the whole game i kicked him he kicked me back i i i elbowed him he elbowed me back and it went on the whole game but in the long run, it probably did me a lot of favours because I, I became firm friends with Wrighty after. And everywhere I went, he sort of followed. I went to Villa, he went to Arsenal. I went to Motherwell in Scotland, he turned up at Celtic. Um, and we and we just we just had this mutual appreciation of each other on the pitch. Um, yeah. Wrighty was very, very clever on the pitch. He, he'd talk to you. He, he'd chun her away in your ear. Uh, get your attention. Next thing, ball had come and he'd gone. And you're like, oh no, what's he done me again? Um, however, I was quite lucky because he didn't score that many goals against us, um, and we did quite well against Arsenal in, in my Villa days. So, but yeah, Wrighty was Wrighty was one of the stars of, of the Palace team. Um, they they also remember had Jeff Thomas, so they had some good players at that time. Um, <laughs> Who was the hardest player? Did you did you ever play against Billy Whitehurst? Because there were a few centre yes. forwards in those days that were. Really, uh -huh. they wouldn't play. The, they wouldn't. They wouldn't get away with it at all these days. Who, who no. was your worst for that? Well, who was Billy was nuts. Yeah, Billy was completely and utterly nuts. And I, <laughs> I remember him chasing Mozzie around the pitch at Hull because um, Mozzie had said something to him, and Billy took exception to it. Um, it was one of Jamie's very first games. Jamie Redknapp's very first games, and I think. Billy had kicked Jamie and and um, they were trying to, Mozzie was trying to protect Jamie a bit and Billy took exception to it and wanted a bit of Mozzie. <laughs> so, but there was, I mean, there was others. Uh, Birmingham had uh, uh, Kevin Francis. <clears throat> and, yeah, and yeah, was, yeah, yeah. He's about six it was the other, It was the other man mountain that played at Birmingham. Uh, Gale, John Gale. John, John Gale, Gale. Yeah. I mean, he was huge. He gave me a hug after the game, after we beat them 1-0. And honestly, what breath was left in me disappeared very quick. It just, it just, <laughs> it, it squeezed me that hard. I think it came out my backside, my nose, and my mouth all at the same time. But and yeah, there was. I mean, it was, a, it was a tough game in them days. Yeah. You know, you, you you looked after yourself, um, and if you didn't, then you know you were going to be on the injured table a lot of the time. Um, and I think you know I knew that, and I, and I was ready for that. Playing in non-league, you learn that anyway. Um, mm. You know, if you're going to go in for it, if you're going to go in for a ball, don't go in half hearted because you'll end up hurting yourself badly. Um, and I think that's where the tackling came from. I think it just it was it was just a period in my life where I'd played at you know at, at the conference level and and it was a tough old league and it and it it just set me up for going into the football league. And what was it like playing under Harry? Was it something that you uh, enjoyed? Uh, yeah, uh, to be honest, yes, I did. Um, 
we have our differences nowadays and I've had my differences with him for a long, long time. But um, at the time, yes, uh, it was good because he made me feel um, wanted. He made me feel like he wanted me in the team and he wanted me at the club. Um, and obviously, Brian Tyler had a lot to do with that as well. Uh, bless his soul. Uh, Brian, Brian was really good when I first came to the club. He, he, he was very, very supportive, uh, very helpful. Uh, and Jimmy Gabriel, of course. Um, Jimmy was the one who would come and come and talk to me at training. He'd, he'd sort of stand on my shoulder while we were doing different things, and he'd he'd, he'd chat. You know, he'd, he'd give you advice. He'd, he'd, he'd tell you things that you were doing wrong, or he thought you were doing wrong. Things you could do better. So there was there was plenty of help at Bournemouth, to be fair. And the players were great. You know, Luther was Luther had a, a wealth of experience. Um, and and you know, if, if you wanted advice, go and knock on Luther's door. It, it, it'll give you all the advice you need. Same with Willow, I suppose. Willow Willow was always a help. Mark Newson as captain was a help. Mozzie was a help because Mozzie had played in the league for so many years. So, you know, they were just a great bunch of lads to play with. And it was a great club at the time. The following season um, was the season where obviously we got relegated. So it, your, 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 the, um, it was your full your first sort of like full season where you started the season as a guaranteed starter, and you started with Paul Miller, um, who'd come down from Tottenham, didn't you? Was was he someone you could learn off, or what sort of? How did you two gel? Yeah, Maxi. No, Maxi was great. I still, again, I still, I still speak to Paul quite regular. Um, I, I, Paul was just a great lad. You know, a, a real, a real proper company. You know, um, what a good, just a good lad, and, a, and he obviously he'd been a top, top player. Um, so, you know, probably getting a bit longer in the tooth at that stage, but he, he, he still performed week in, week out. Um, and again, another one that was full of experience, who I could, who I could pick bits off if I wasn't sure about something. I'd ask, um, and they were always willing to give me the advice I needed. Mm -hmm. And that was a tough season, wasn't it? Because you played up until March, you got injured, and there were a host of injuries that, that led us to that relegation. What, yeah. What, I, what, would, I, what, what was it like playing for that team in that season? It must have been pretty tough, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, we, we'd sort of done okay up until just after Christmas. We were, we were, we were sort of okay. We, we were quite confident that we'd be okay. Um, and then, like you said, uh, the injuries started to hit. Um, <laughs> and what made it worse was some of them were self-inflicted injuries. So Paul Molden did my knee uh, on the Monday. We played Port Vale on the Saturday, which, funny enough, was the 10th of March, my birthday. Um, and we'd won, uh, but Paul hadn't been in the team, and and, and he Monday morning he wasn't he wasn't in a great mood, Paul. Um, things hadn't gone well for him since he, you know he came down with this reputation of banging goals in left, right, and centre. And in all in all fairness to Paul, he'd struggled. He struggled to get a starting position. He struggled to score goals. And on the Monday, for for whatever reason, I'll never know why he did it. Harry decided we'd have a practice match down at the aerodrome where we trained at the time. And uh, Paul took it out on my left knee uh, and literally hit me that hard. My kneecap popped through the back uh, and ripped my medial ligament out the bone. Um, and that was my season done. You know, I was within three hours. I was in surgery, uh, ten days in hospital, and then the long road to recovery. There was always rumours at the time that, that he he because he left straight after that 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 was as a result of that, wasn't it? It was. It was. Yeah, yeah. that wasn't a rumour. That was true. Harry yeah. Harry was incensed. To be fair, um, and, and just got rid of him straight away. Just got rid of him because Harry knew Harry knew. It would take something drastic for me not to be able to play. Um, I don't know if anybody's... There. I, I once played at Bournemouth with chicken pots. Right. Um, I, I looked hilarious because um, Harry, Harry had phoned Stuart that morning and said, listen, Sean's got chicken pots. Um, he's not going to be able to play. And Stuart went, well, I wouldn't quite write him off yet if you spoke to him. So Harry phoned me, how are you, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I've got chicken pots. He said, uh, how do you feel? I said, I feel great, man. He said, well, you're not going to play tonight, are you? I said, well, I've got every intention to play, and if you're picking me. So I turned up covered in spots. <laughs> and I can't remember who we played, but they must have thought, what the is going on here? <laughs> so I played and got man of the match. <laughs> and Harry was like, Harry was like, 
going mad in the paper the next day about how well I played considering, and yet nobody was supposed to know I had chicken pox. So, but that, 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 I suppose that's down to upbringing. That, that that was the way I was taught. You know, yeah. unless unless someone's chopped your legs off, you play. You just get on with it. Um, and as I found out later in my career, certain managers expected you to play with a leg missing. Um, you know. Uh, and put pressure on for you to play when you really shouldn't have been playing football. So when did it sour with Harry? Was it towards the end of that season? It soured um, about 14 days, about two weeks after I'd had my operation on my knee. Um, and it all, it, it, it all started with uh, Carol, my wife, going to the ground, being, being driven to the ground, to pick up my mail and Carol had gone, knocked on the door as, as, as we all, we all did. That was the way it was, you know, your, your mail was in a little mailbox. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd said to Carol, oh, do us a favor, get Tony, who's a friend of ours, get him to run you down and go and get the mail, but go and get my mail. Cause I need to, I'll have things to sign and this and the other. Um, so she did. And on the way out, um, Harry came screeching into the car park. He'll probably he'll tell you this is a load of crap. He'll tell you his side of the story, obviously. Um, jumped out of his car and started started shouting all these obscenities at Carol to the point where she burst into tears. So it must have been bad because Carol's not one to burst into tears for nothing. Um, she got in the car, came back, told me what had happened. I jumped straight in the car. Tony, mate, ran us back to the ground and I had it out with Harry in, in, in his office. Um, and then, of course, he wrote a book and decided to write an absolute pile of shit in the book, excuse my French, um, about how Carol had tried to run him over, um, <laughs> blah, 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 which is quite strange seeing that she didn't have a licence and didn't have a car. Yeah. But he sold, he sold a shed load of books and, he, and he, he didn't do it once. He did, a, he did a, a duplicate of the book, a second series of the book, and did the same thing. Right. Hence, I don't speak to Harry. I don't need to speak to people who lie about things. If he's got to write crap to sell a book, then so be it. You know, and that, and I've never spoken to him since, and I wouldn't, because I've got no, I've got no respect for the man after that. Fair so you, you actually, you went to that final game of that season, the notorious Leeds, Leeds game, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I dodged, I dodged the bricks while I was on my crutches. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I had to go on the pitch to get to get my Player of the Year award um, on crutches, which wasn't very good. And it wasn't. I, I, to me, I didn't want to be there, if I'm honest. You know, I was down enough as it is. The last thing I needed was to go and run around trying to get Miss Bricks going around my head. So I went because I had to go, really. But if I'd have had the choice, I'd have stayed at home. Mm. Um, and we were down anyway, really. Mm. From that point, we, you know, we weren't going to save ourselves then. We were gone. Um, and, and my focus by that time was was really on getting fit for the next season. And then, of course, what happened in the summer um, made everything a, a bit upside down with the the crash in Italy and you know Brian dying, Harry being in a mess, um, and Tony Peel is taking over. Yeah. How did you get on with Tony? Because obviously he went on. He went on to have a very long um, managerial career, but a very special sort of specialist manager managerial career. Not everyone's cup of tea. How how were you with him? Yeah, yeah and a, and a very short career at Sheffield Wednesday, Neil. You should say. I was just yeah. I was just going to say his managerial career didn't last that long there, though. No. <laughs> was it forty five days? <laughs> I, I, to be fair, t Tony was a, f a fitness fanatic. That was the one thing about Tony. He 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 expected himself to be very fit, so he expected you to be, which in a way wasn't a bad thing for me. Um, you know, not not saying that I wasn't fit because I was, but it, I think he gave me that extra boost to get fitter, to make myself stronger, to be fitter quicker. Um, and I got, I got on fine with Tony. I, I had no real issues with Tony at all. And uh, last time I saw Tony at, at um, Villa Park, I had a chat with him. Um, you know, and of course he had Terry Shanahan with him at the time, helping him. Um, and I'll always remember Terry. We we we'd done the preseason, we'd done all the miles and blah blah blah, and we were playing Newport in a friendly uh, at Newport. 
and it was my it was my first game since since the tackle um so we played the game i think I, I, the score was irrelevant and i can't remember i think we were winning uh and we got to 80 minutes and uh i was fine uh, but i put my hand up and and said uh can i come off i'm i'm, I'm getting tired and he pulled me after the game terry he says don't ever do that to me again he said because there's nothing wrong with you he said you just fancied a blow he said, you'd had enough and you just wanted some time off. He said, don't. He said, just play the game. He said, you're fine. You, you look fine. You, you know, you played well. You're back to how you were before the accident. Um, just go and play. You don't have to pretend you're injured when you're not. And it sort of stuck with me ever since then. And, you know, thanks to Terry, I've never did it again. <laughs> Excellent. And that season was a pretty pretty good season. I mean, we nearly got promotion. Arguably, we should have got promotion that season. What, what do you remember about it? Um, you know what? Not a lot, if I'm honest. Um, that season, I, it's just a blur that season. I don't know why, but it's just a blur. I don't know. Uh, you know, I can't even remember games. And normally, I'm very good. I can remember games that I've played in from different seasons for different clubs. And that season... It's like a blank in my memory, and I don't know why. I have no idea. You'd have was, to remind it, me of games. It was a season where um, it, it, that side, I was just looking back um, about an hour ago. I was looking at the squad that season. I mean, there's no way that squad should have finished ninth in that league. I mean, obviously, you had yourself in it, uh, Luther Bissett, Efanakoku. Um, do, you, you remember him, do you remember him coming through? Yeah, the Chief. Yeah. 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 God, he was quick. He was quick, G. Funny enough, there was a thing on Facebook this week. There was a picture of. Do you remember when they did the the hundred meters sprint at Wembley? Yeah. yeah. And there was a picture of that, and it's Efren in his red and black stripes. Obviously, I love that kit. By the way, the red and black stripes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And there's Efren stood bolt upright sprinting. <laughs> I'm thinking that's it. <laughs> Efren, by the way, he's like garbage on the TV. But hey ho, you can't do everything well. Yeah. Well, no. When he when he got past the back four, that was him gone. I mean, he was. Uh, uh, yeah. It took a long while to learn how to finish, but yeah. um But once he learned how to finish, he was up off off up off up the leagues like yourself. So yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he did. He, he he definitely got better and better as he went through uh, the yeah. different levels. Um, and and Chief was always Effa was was just a nice lad. He was always a nice lad. Worked hard. Wanted to improve. Um, you know, a fair play to him. He got to the top in the end, and, and that's what it was all about. And didn't we have Gavin Peacock in that season? Yeah, so? Gavin in Canada now. Gavin, isn't he? He's a he's a the, he's in the clergy. Yeah. He friend requested me on LinkedIn the other day. Quite strange. How weird's that? After come to all save these your years, soul. Come to save your soul. <laughs> there's no hey, listen. There's no saving this soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's never going to happen. Was Was Andy Jones still with us? Yeah, he do, he joined that year. That's what Go I mean. Ahead, yeah, Blissett Jones and a Coco up front, and that side only finished ninth. What's yeah, Jones, Jones was a good player. Jones yeah. was a, a a class act. Um, he took a little bit to settle as well. Um, but you know, he he he, he was he knew what he was doing. He was one of those players who you could give the ball to and he'd hold it up, lay it off or, or turn and shoot. Um, and you knew what you were going to get from him. I think remind Wood, me of some other players that were there. Paul, Wood, Paul Wood joined as well. Didn't Paul Wood join that season? He was a winger. Yeah, from, Woody, was, yeah. Fantastic yeah. player. Yeah, I played with Woody in Hong Kong in 1977. Um, in, uh, that's another story. Oh, dear. Um uh, and he was still, he was um, he was super super fit, Paul. Um, when you go to Hong Kong, or you did at the time, there was only eight teams. You had to do a fitness test, and it it struck it struck fear into us. Oh, oh, I was thirty, blah, blah, what was I? At the time thirty four, I think maybe thirty five. And you had to run. You had to do uh, twelve laps of a four hundred meter um, track in seven minutes. And I was like, what? And if you don't do it, you get three. I know, yeah. You get three attempts. And if you don't do it, that you're on the plane back home. That's your career in Hong Kong, up the Swanee. 
not that having a career in Hong Kong is anything to gloat about, really. <laughs> you know. Um, so we we practiced it, and uh, apart from Woody, nobody got anywhere near it. We also had Martin Cooley in my team in Hong Kong at the time. Right. Um, so there was me, Cooley, Peter Guthrie. Um, oh. So there was a few of us. There were six English lads, actually. Ian Muir from Tranmere. So yeah. we, we had decent players out there. Um, but could we could we get over the line in in seven minutes? Could we hell? <laughs> we were we were we were two laps short every time. Um, and then the, the the fateful day comes along where you, each club turns up at this track, and you all run together. That just your club. Um, so there's there's like pressure, unbelievable pressure on you. Um, anyway, we we did it, and we all got through by about. 30 seconds but would you have done his 12 laps in about five and a half minutes he literally just blasted <laughs> around i think he overtook me three times and i'm like what the honestly unbelievable fitness and, and you know woody in hong kong was woody he'd take people on for fun he'd yeah. just get the ball and take people on um me and cooley did the kicking so we were the ones that kicked everybody and the Chinese hated us because we kicked everybody. Um, we were always we always being told by the coach to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll change now. Now I've come to Hong Kong, I'll change the way I play, should I? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and Ian Muir just stick the ball in the back of the net. Peter Guthrie, Peter Guthrie was out there for about ten years in the end. Um, oh, he was, he was, he was so far up the owner's backside. Honestly, you couldn't get him for his legs hanging out. Honestly, he was <laughs> honestly he was he was so thick with the owner um who manufactured knickers for Marks and Spencers. But this fellow was minted and he owned the club and, and he was Peter was his mate. Um and made a good made a good little career for himself out there. And uh, did you did you think or were you aware that a big club like Villa was watching you when you were born within that final season? No, no. Uh that that's there'd been um, rumblings about different clubs. Wimbledon were one. Wimbledon were a, a, a very definite fancy taking me. Reading were another one, um, although I don't quite see why I'd go to Reading, uh, if I was honest, and that's no disrespect to Reading. Um, and the Villa thing came about quite strangely because we were. I was on my very first foreign holiday, apart from going to Magaluf with the lads, with Carol and the kids, and we were in Lanzarote. Um and we got we got to the airport on the Friday. I think we were supposed to be in on the Saturday, first day back in. Um, and they cancelled the plane because it was broken. So I'm in a panic then. Oh shit! So I phoned the club, uh, told the club what had happened. Blah blah blah. Um, I got home on the I got home on the Saturday. Um, went in on the Sunday because we were in on the Sunday as well, uh, and got a bit of a lecture off Harry for being late back. And then told uh, I was meeting Ron Atkinson at the Royal Bath later that day. Like, oh right, why? Because <laughs> I had no, I, I had no idea. Because I've been in Lanzarote, I, I had no idea that Ron had took the job at, at, at Villa because he was right. Sheffield Wednesday manager. He walked out, you know. Um, he said, "Yeah, he's moved to Villa, uh, and he's coming down to speak to you." I'm like, uh, "Okay, I better phone my agent." Um, so I found my agent, and and he came down as well. Uh, and we, I sat in the royal bath with uh, Ron. Uh, and obviously, Villa's a huge club, and it wasn't, it wasn't really difficult to sell uh, the move to me. Um, the only thing that that I wasn't sure about was whether whether really he was um, he was buying me to play in the first team, or he was buying me as a squad player. Yeah. I, I yeah. had no idea. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know Ron. I didn't know anybody at, at Villa at the time. Um, so I, I literally had no idea. Um, but, he, you know, I spoke to him and, and he, he, his first question was the strangest question I was ever asked as a player. And he asked me what I thought my strengths were. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. You're trying to sign me. Are you sure, are you, sure you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> it was just it's just the most bizarre question. Yeah. Uh, I went, well, uh, I'm fairly quick. I'm, I'm strong in the air. I quite like a tackle. Um, oh, good. Right. What car do you drive? 
what? <laughs> what car do you drive? I went, well, I've got a, I've got a Ford Orion gear with, with skirts on and my name on the side of it, which I did at the time. And he went, you can't come to Villa in that. <laughs> I went, thank you, Paul. I said, you can't come to Villa. He said, uh, he said, so here's the deal we're going to offer you. And on top of that, we'll give you uh, an extra 15 grand to buy yourself a nice car. Because we can't give you a club car at the moment because there's none left. Okay. I'm thinking, this is a weird get. This is a weird setup. Does it always work like this? So I sold my Orion. I got four and a half K for my Orion. So I had 90 and a half grand to buy a car with. So I bought my first Mercedes, funny enough. Second hand Mercedes for 11 grand and put the rest of it in my bank. I thought, happy days. This can't go wrong. This, um, and and I was off within within two days. I was I was in Birmingham. Uh, three days I was in Germany on tour, and I was like, this is surreal because it just didn't happen like that at Bournemouth or Weymouth or any of the other clubs. So again, so it's another big step up. So again, I'm, I'm assuming you didn't have any uh, any self doubts um, as you didn't the, fir the first step up you made. Was um, so you would have played with players like Paul McGrath and people like that. Was did you notice that the level was just completely different to anything that you'd seen before? Um, no, if I'm honest, no. If, if anything, uh, to be honest, I found it easier because it was it was less frantic. Um, yeah. it, it was more structured. So, you know, there was there was. Uh, I'm, uh, I'd signed, obviously. I'd gone on tour. I got uh, up there. They put me in a hotel um, while Carol sorted everything out down in Bournemouth. Um, and in the hotel, Kevin Richardson, who had just signed, who was to become skipper, um, Steve Stoughton. Um, there was about five of us in there. So, as a group, we got to know each other really quickly, which on the field helped because I had Steve Stoughton at on the left side of me at fullback anyway. So me and Steve knew each other quite well, although he, he's one of the most whinging, moaning I've ever played with. Um, I had Paul as quiet as a mouse on the other side of me. Um, and the only thing Paul would say to me was, and, I, and at this stage, I had no idea about Paul's problems. You know, I, I didn't know Paul had an issue So um, with the old uh, drink. So um, he was just a quiet Irishman to me. I didn't know an awful lot about him, if I was quite honest. Mm -hmm. Um, but I got to know Paul pretty quickly. Um, I, I got to know sort of what made him tick. Um, in fact, I got to know what made him tick on the on the trip to, to Germany. Uh, when we trained in the morning, and and Ron had, Ron had left the camp to come back to England because he was selling David Platt to Bari. Um, and he'd left Andy Gray in charge of us, so we trained in the morning. And we'd been given time off. And my, my room partner, another one that's passed away, Les Seeley, um, we'd gone for a walk down into the village where we were, um, walked into this cafe to have a brew, and who's in the corner? Paul, absolutely pie-eyed, uh, with all these bottles on this round table, just empty bottles of lager. And I'm like, I had no idea. And, uh, Les is like, listen, let's get a taxi. We'll get him back up there. Jim Walker's a physio. Jim will sort him out. We get him back up there. And we're, we're, we're playing head tennis on concrete tennis courts in the afternoon. And Andy Gray says, Paul's got to join in. So Paul came down with studs on, on concrete. It was like Bambi on ice. Honestly, it was hilarious. He was slipping and sliding everywhere. He was, he was that pie-eyed anyway. He couldn't see the ball. So it made no damn difference, really. So, so the, uh, they made Jim Walker take him to, back to his room Um took all his money off him and locked him in his room. So that was him sleep it off. When we finished training an hour later, walked back to the hotel, he sat in the bar drinking again, Paul. He's only shimmied down the drain pipe, walked around and was putting all the drinks <laughs> on Aston Villa's bill. Brilliant. And that was that was that was my cue for, for playing in the in the top league. It's like, oh great, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was Big Ron like? Because um I mean, again, he's a, a player. It seems to be a player's manager, doesn't he? And in, in the players seem to really enjoy playing for him. Um, yeah, players, players loved playing for him from the fact of the way he played. Yes, I agree with that. You know, it was, um, it was go out and play and pass the ball, enjoy it, um, but make sure you win. Uh, 
we used to get things said to us like me and Paul he'd say to us uh, listen you two num numpties just go and win the ball and give it to those that can play and he'd say that all the time as if as if we couldn't play ourselves it was like just go and win the ball and give it to those that can play right okay Ron so we got to the point me and Paul were when we'd when we'd run out Paul would say to me listen we'll do it our way forget what he's told us in the dressing room yeah, right, Maka. Okay, we get on the pitch, and you know, you wave to the fans, blah blah. Kick off, and within probably ten minutes, R Ron would be screaming at me and Paul. And Paul is Paul would say to me, "Just put your hand up." So, so you you've recognised, you've heard him. We're getting at half time, and we get we get torn strips off, and it was like, "Don't you ever effing do this to me again? Don't do." I know what you're playing at. I know your game. You're just ignoring me. No, we're not, Rob. <laughs> Next game, same thing. And and in the end, it got to the point where he just gave up shouting at us and just let us get on with it because he knew he knew how good Paul was anyway. Um, and I was lucky in the sense that my partnership with Paul with Paul um, came to fruition really quickly, and we got to know each other's game really quickly. So it was it was easy playing with Paul and and. Paul said the same about playing with me because we got we got to know each other so well so quickly. Mm. So it was you know it was my, my time at Villa was was fantastic simply because I got to play with Paul McGar for four years um, as what he says is his best centre half partner. So uh, that that's the biggest accolade I could have of someone mm. like Paul. And you nearly nearly won the league, didn't you? Yeah, ninety two. Oh, we threw it away in the end. Um, we were we were. We were playing so so well. We were banging goals in. We had Daly and Dino up front. We were just banging goals in left, right, and centre. Dwight York to come on, but if that wasn't working, you know. Um, and then for some reason, the goals dried up with about five games to go. Um, and it's funny because I suppose the turning point was I think we we drew at home to someone like Oldham. It was either Oldham or Coventry, and United beat Sheffield Wednesday when Steve Bruce scored the two headers in the seventh minute of injury time. Yeah. And from that point, we seemed to just splutter. Uh, and we we literally spluttered over the line and they walked away with it. They won it by 10 points in the end. But there was never 10 points in it. You know, we were we were as good as them at the time. Hmm. It was a it was a great it was a great time for English football the the advent of the Premier League and money coming into it and different players. I was thinking you probably would have played against Klinsman and yeah. Thierry Henry and people like that. Who was the who was the hardest? Who who really really put you through the ringer? Um, Henry was after me, so he wasn't he wasn't in the oh, Premier yeah. League at that stage. Um, we had the likes of Klinsman, Zola, um, you know, people like that. Uh, <sighs> Klinsman was a handful. Although, funny enough, I don't think in, in all the games we played against him at Tottenham, he ever scored. Um, but there was, you know, uh, Zola would, would probably go down as one of the best ever foreigners to come into the Premier League. Yeah. Um, and he was he was exquisite. The things he could do with the ball um, were just unbelievable. Uh, and then, you know, there was a there was a lot of there was a lot of very 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 good homegrown players at the time. Um, Lineker, you know, yeah, right. Uh, a very young Alan Shearer coming through. Um, you know, there's there's some terrific players uh, all around all around the Premier League at that stage. So you know, to to give United well, Cantona there, there's not talking about foreigners. Yeah. One of the best, one of the best, you know, and they also at that stage had, had the likes of Paul Lynch, Roy Keane, Pallister Bruce, you know, Erwin Parker. Schmeichel, another one. Um, you know, they, they were a terrific side, but we, we ran them all the way. I mean, uh, um, like I said, we let ourselves down right at the death. Why it happened, who knows? We just we just buckled for some reason. And it can't have been, it can't have been. It's not like it, it was pressure because, you know, they knew what they were doing, we didn't. They hadn't won the league in 25 years. Yeah. So we were both in the same boat, really. You know, we, in fact, if anything, we we'd won the old first division ten years earlier. Yeah, nineteen eighty. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. Um, Twelve years earlier. So, you know, it, it, I can't answer the question because I don't know. I don't know what happened. 
I don't know why. It just we started making silly mistakes and giving silly goals away, and we couldn't score goals. Um, and for four or five games, it, it it killed us. And did that make victory over them in the the League Cup final a couple of years later all the sweeter? Um, yeah, of course. You know, we we we. we f- I suppose we felt in our own, in back of our own minds, we felt hard done to because we, if we'd have lost it by two points or three points, maybe it wouldn't have been as hurtful. But we blew up the game, and they won it by ten points. And to see Brian Kidd jumping around Old Trafford when they beat Sheffield Wednesday is, is the most galling sight on a football thing I've ever seen, and it still galls me to this. I can't watch it; it does my head in. I'd like to punch his lights out just for doing it. <laughs> Sorry, Brian, <laughs> but you know um, things like that you remember. Uh, so, so two years later to go to Wembley, um, given the way we'd gone to Wembley as well, because we didn't play a single game at home apart from the very first round, which was two legged against Birmingham City, which was uh, my only two ever derbies that I played in. Um, we went to Sunderland and got absolutely smashed off the park and won 4 1. And you, uh, we went <laughs> exactly, we went to Arsenal and won, we went to Tottenham and won. So you think, hmm, if you're winning them kind of games, then, you know, you're doing something right. And then, of course, the, the infamous Tramia, the two-legged, getting beat 3-1 in the first leg, of which I was suspended. Um, and then scoring and winning it on penalties in the second leg was was just an unbelievable day, atmosphere. You know, it's it's one of... If, if anybody speaks to me at Villa Park now, and I'm a regular visitor to, to Villa Park when fans are allowed in, that is always the first thing that's ever mentioned to me. That day, that the goal at, again, the diving edge against Tranmere, and that day, um, and I suppose it's just it's an iconic game in, in the history of Aston Villa Football Club. Did you ever come close to an England cap? Do you think? Did you ever? Was that on your agenda, your radar? Yeah. You you know more than you're letting on. <laughs> That's why I fell out with Ron. That was my big fallout with with Ron Atkinson. Um, I I I'd, I'd gone to an England training camp with Earl Barrett and Kevin Richardson halfway through that that 94 season. Um, there'd been a lot of talk about me getting in the England squad. Anyway, I was called up to, just to a training camp. There was no game. So I went, trained, same old, same old faces, Wrighty, uh, Alan Shearer, um, all them kind of players. Um, you know, a, a real good squad, Graham, so all them type of players. Um, and then there was going to be three games at the end of that season. Uh, I think they were all at Wembley, if I'm right. Uh, and not not big games, but international games. You know, chance to, chance to win your your, your first cap. Um, uh, we won. We beat United in the final. <laughs> we played Newcastle about three weeks later, and uh, I got tackled uh, from behind by Andy Cole. And he damaged my Achilles um, and my ankle pretty badly to the point where I came off before half time. Um, and that was the start of the demise of my relationship with Ron because he came in the dressing room after the game and came out with just a smart comment about, oh, if it had been Wembley, you wouldn't have come off though, would you? Mm. And it was like, well, I would have actually because I can't walk. And it was just, I don't know why he said it and I don't know what made him say it or what. What, what he thought he was going to get at saying it, but I missed the rest of the season, which was about four games. I think. And then I was called up into this squad to play these three internationals. And without asking me or speaking to me, he phoned Terry Venables and pulled me out of the squad without saying a word to me. And then pulled me about a week later and said, oh, by the way, I pulled you out of the uh, England squad. You're not fit. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm not fit? I'm back training. What do you mean I'm not fit? Well, I don't think your ankle's ready yet. Right, okay. Whatever. And he went, but you're coming to South Africa and playing in three games down the end of season tour. So, and you can imagine my response to that. Yeah. Can't play for England, but I can play for Villa. In a, yeah, but we need first team players down there. You know, the the, uh, the Irish lads won't be there because they're in America. Um playing in the World Cup, which, funny enough, that's where he was <laughs> in America. Anyway, so I went, I went along with it. I had no choice, really. I went along with it. I went to South Africa, played in three, strapped me up, 
to where my ankle wouldn't move, basically playing three games. Thought it was clever to make me captain in the first game against Liverpool. Um, I suppose the one thing that happened on, on the tour that was fantastic and would never have happened otherwise, we got to meet Nelson Mandela. So, you know, that's one little bucket list tick off, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. So we get us on the plane on the way home. Uh, I needed uh, a double hernia and I needed a rebuild of my nose because Mark Bosnich, very friendly on the uh, training the day before the cup final, decided to punch me instead of the ball and smash my nose to pieces. Um, so that this was all agreed on the plane. This is what would happen. I'd, go, I'd get back, we'd go on our holiday because we had our holidays booked already. Um, and then I'd have the operations as soon as I got back. And with that, he said, yeah, you have an extra two weeks coming when the Irish lads come back from America. So gets home, bags of packed, straight on the plane, straight to Florida, funny enough. Walking around Disney Marketplace, you do a bump into Big Ron and his wife, Maggie. And he literally blanked me as though I didn't exist. Uh, Maggie spoke to Carol, but Ron wouldn't even look at me. And I didn't know why. I, d I had no idea what was going on. Uh, so we left and it was like, oh, you know, whatever, whatever. We'll see when I get back. Um, and on the day that the, the rest of the lads were due to start training, they were going to, is it Bovington? To a, is it an army camp? Yeah, yeah Bovington camp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were going down there to do pre-season. Nice. Well, I'd literally had my nose done the week before. So I wasn't going. There's no way I could have gone. Go down there and be beasted. I remember going there with Bournemouth, funny enough, and that was bad enough. So I got a phone call off uh, Jim Barron on the morning. And he said, um, uh, I spoke to uh, I spoke to Ron last night. You're in tomorrow. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yeah, you are. I said, no, I'm not. I said, uh, he gave me two extra weeks. I've, I only have a nose on last week, and I'm still not right from my hernias yet. I've still got – I'm only just on straight running. So I couldn't go anyway. Uh, so I refused to go. And uh, paid the price for it in the end because he came back, still wouldn't speak to me, <laughs> uh, blanked me, walked past me in the corridor, blanked me, typical childish things that managers do, and then pulled me in the in the dressing room, in the in his office, and said, uh, "We're at Everton first game of the season. You're not playing. You're on you're on the bench. It's your own fault. I'm playing you. Go instead. It's your own fault. You should have thought about what you were doing." Um, so they basically lied to me. They, they told me on the plane I could do it, and then they, they turned tables on me when I wasn't even there. Um, and that was me. I lost all respect for him as well. So, and isn't it funny that he wrote a book and wrote a pile of crap as well? <laughs> um, so, But him and, him and Ari are thick as thieves anyway, you see, and I always have been. So it's, it doesn't come as a surprise that, that the same thing happened again, that if you can't get it shown, because no, they, they couldn't get at me. I, 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 my skin's as thick as a rhino. They, they won't get to me, so they, so they go after my family. So he did exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. Called Carol for something that she never did. So again, he, uh, I lost, I lost all the respect for him. I went to a, I went to a reunion, uh, a ten-year reunion for the for the '94 Cup win, uh, 2004, and I said to the comper, "Do not put me on that stage next to him." So what did he do? <laughs> and everybody who was around the tables where I was sat before knew exactly what was going on and they were pissing themselves laughing because I was just looking at him and just say, you know, I I'm not even going to speak to him. And I didn't speak to him. I blanked him. He said something to me on a microphone and I blanked him. I just ignored him. So sure, this, this is rapidly turning into a, a conversation about managers you didn't get on with. So can I ask you about John Aldridge? I, I, could, I, could, I could, to be fair, I could carry on with half, <laughs> half a dozen others. <laughs> John, Aldridge, John Aldridge is next, wasn't he? Was he John right? Aldridge fell out, with him. <laughs> yeah, fell out with him. I could give you a story about Billy Davis. I could give you a story about him. You know what it is about the managers? They're all, they're all, they've all got egos about themselves, huge egos about themselves. And they don't like it when someone stands up to them. And unfortunately, that was my makeup. Mm. I didn't sit there and take it. I'd stand up to them. So I didn't get on with many. Stuart Morgan was probably about Stuart Morgan and Cliff Roberts in my non-league days were probably about the two I did get on with. Yeah. 
Johnny King tram in before he got sat. Yeah, but no, the rest he, he was manager, Johnny King. Yeah, yeah, he was old school. John, he was, you know, he was funny. He used to come out with some really weird things in his, in his meetings, and you know, you'd think, oh God, where does that come from? But he was genuine, and he was a down to earth person. And the rest of them, for me, weren't. And that that was that was the downside to it all. So you talked about playing in Hong Kong earlier. Was it because you fell out with John Aldridge? Did he think that was kind of punishment to loan you to a club in Hong no. Kong? <laughs> no, he thought it was a great move for my career. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he tried. He tried to sell it, but he didn't realise at the time. Um, I was on, I, I went to Tramway, and, and and I've got no qualms about saying it. I, I left Aston Villa and went to Tramway for money. At the end of the day, because I was to become Tramway's record signing, which I still am to this day, and the deal they offered me was ridiculous. And I mean, for a club at Tramway, it was ridiculous. So when when Aldridge got the job, he wanted me out the door because he wanted my money. He wanted to use my money to rebuild the team. And while I was there, he couldn't do it. So instead of instead of sort of saying to me, listen, you know, I need you to go, Sean, you, you know, you're costing us too much, you can't do it. He left me out the team. And he set a, he set a bit of a he set a bit of a scam up at the at the ground where um I got in trouble because of something I did. But he set it up and I fell for it. So I had a, I had it out with the chairman, blah 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 blah. All, all happened. And then uh, I was training with the kids. I wasn't even I wasn't even training with the pros. I was training with the kids. That was my punishment. And then on uh, I got this phone call from Peter Guthrie. Funny enough, Peter came along again, um passed me on to this Mr. Chan. Not a shot. I spoke to him and he said, listen, we'll give you the same money you're on at, at Tramway. So I went to see Aldridge the next day and he, his first words made me think quick on my feet. And he went, oh, it's a great move for you. Just to get me out of it. It's a great move for you. Yeah, what a move. Good for your career, that. And I thought, you arse. How can that be a great move? So I went, well, I'm not going. <laughs> and his face dropped. Honestly, it was like a brick. I went, he went, oh, what do you mean? I said, I can't go. I said, because they'll only pay me half of what I'm getting here. I said, I'm not giving my contract up like that. He went, don't worry. We'll give you the other half. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was getting my full whack, plus another half off tram here for three months. And off I went. And I was like, see, yeah, fool. And I told him years later, I did a, I did a Paul McGrath night. Um, and he came he, he came along to do that. He was, he was supposedly a um, special guest. And he, they sat him next to me. They always sit them next to me, you see. Well, I, can't, it's box it's box I, box I can't hold my water. So <laughs> I say what's on my mind. So as soon as he sat next to me, I couldn't help. I had to tell him. And he was like, oh. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, that's the way things are. You, you know, it, it was the way it was. And he, he wanted rid of me and I had to go, I suppose. Were you surprised, um, sort of jumping forward a bit, uh, to see what happened with Bournemouth, with Eddie Howe and getting into the Premier League, was it because obviously you would have had an affinity with the club? It was n not a club that anyone ever thought would do that well, was it? No, no. I mean, I, 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 I think Eddie would admit that at the time. You know, to 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 get that move into the Premiership must have been um, a, a massive shock to everybody at the club. Hmm. You know, the, don't get me wrong. In the in the, at the time they were playing really well. But that 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 one last step is a massive step, um, and of course the first thing you think of then is you fear for them going into the Premier League. Can they hold their own? Well, you know the the good thing is nobody knows anything about them really. So they they caught a lot of teams very cold early on with the style of football that that Eddie had instilled into the team. You know this passing and movement that. You know, was was second to none at the time. That you know, they were terrific to watch when they first came up. Not that they're not terrific now, but I don't get to see them that often anymore. So, did you watch um, a lot of the games? Did you did you still follow us and watch them? I still follow you. I don't get to. I, I watch when they're on the TV. Yeah, yeah. In a strange coincidence, I've never been invited back down there ever. You're not anybody. you're not alone in saying that. We've had a number of ex players on here that have been a little disappointed with the fact that there's never been tickets or never any any show of appreciation. Well, there's no. It's like there's no former players club or anything. Yeah. So you just don't. You know, I, I've never, I've never had ever heard anything off anybody at Bournemouth Football Club. Never. Just um, us. Just us. Just you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Let's see if we can sort that which out. Is, which, to be fair, Jeff, is 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 really disappointing for a yeah, club. It is. That's it is. Bad. You know, mm. I mean, apart from uh, well, I was the one before Eddie. You know, I I got all six Player of the Year awards two years on the bounce. Eddie was the next one to do it. I think Fletch was the next one after that to do yeah. it. Mm. There's only there's only a few of us ever done it. You know, I bet Fletch gets an invite all the time, and I bet Eddie's all down there all the time. Mm. You know, and it's just it's that lack of respect in a in a way. You know, a lack of respect what we did for the club while we were there. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's probably there's a little bit around uh, of a lot of fans who only really started following us when we became more successful. Yeah, and they, you know, for people like Neil and I who watched club for many many years, you know, we're aware of of the stars that used to play for us, like yourself. And uh -huh. a, a lot of those players who were really good went on to other clubs. You know, we were a stepping stone to someone else, which is different yeah. to where yeah. we are now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's probably the highest compliment I could pay you, Sean, is that when you see um, loads of fans do lists, don't they, of their greatest ever squads? And because of the success of the recent team, there aren't that many old players that feature anymore. But yourself and Ian Bishop are regulars in, in an awful lot of... of Best 11s that get picked. Well, that's nice to know. Yeah. Yeah. It is nice to know. I mean, I'd, uh, I'd, uh, I've always had a good affinity with fans wherever I've been. Um, the Bournemouth thing was we'd finish games and instead of going into into the players' lounge, we might have one in the players' lounge and then we'd go in the club at the end, you know, under the yeah. stand. We'd yeah. go in there and, and stand with the fans and have a pint. You know, Carol and the, and the boys would be with me. We'd all go in there and we'd stay. And have three or four pints. You could in them days, couldn't you? You could get away with it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we'd, Carol's mum and dad, who were, who were quite elderly at the time, would come down and stay with us in Bournemouth. Um, and if there was a bingo night on, her mum loved bingo, we'd go and play bingo on the, on the Saturday night. So we'd go back to the club and play bingo. And there were still loads of fans there then. Um, yeah. So, and that's happened wherever I've gone, really. I've always had, I've always been lucky. I've got on with the fans. I've, they've chucked to me and I've chucked to them. So, you know, fans are everything in the game. If you if you haven't got the sport of the fans, then you're wasting your time anyway. Yeah. Would Would you have enjoyed playing Premier League football now? Do you think? <laughs> you enjoyed the money. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I might not have been on the pitch very long. <laughs> um, no, I suppose I suppose it's like anything else. Y you'd um, y your game would have changed. You know, it wouldn't. Your game would have adapted to 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 what it needed to adapt to. So you know, gone would have been that you can't slide tackle now, really, can you? Because you can't get away with it. It's seen as being out of control now. Um, when a proper slide tackle is is probably you at your best, controlling your body at its best. You know, sliding, winning the ball, coming away with the ball. You know, but the, you just don't see it nowadays. I mean, to be honest, you don't really see tackles anymore. It's all about interceptions. It's all about reading the game and interceptions. Um, there's very few, as we used to call them, block tackles, 50-50 tackles. It doesn't, not in the Premier League, it doesn't really happen anymore. Um, yeah, I'd have, liked, I'd have loved to have played in it at any time in my career because it's the pinnacle. Um, the money would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wouldn't still be working for a living. Um and I did okay out of I, I did okay out of football in the end. I did, you know, I've got a decent pension. I don't I don't want for anything. You know, if I want to go on holiday, we go on holiday. But you know, let's face it now, you know, one, one contract and you're a millionaire in, in any Premier League now. Yeah, uh, you were the generation just before the real money, wasn't it? Because now now you see some bang average players that, that are driving around in but you know, baby Bentleys and and they've got all yeah. of that. And it and I, I always think it's a shame really because you know, there was a lot, a lot of players, an awful lot better than them, that that you know didn't didn't get access to those riches. But it, it, that's that's life; it moves on, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think it started building about ninety seven. Yeah, the money started to change. Well, I was in Hong Kong when that started. I came back, I went to Motherwell for two years, um, and and the money in uh, in Scotland hadn't really changed that much. Uh, maybe Rangers and Celtic were building at that stage. Um, but that was it, really. You know, uh, I left Scotland, came back to Carlisle, and then I was 36. I would just retired. Well, I retired from playing full time. My leg, I didn't want to train every day. I'd had enough by then. And I was, I was never going to make that money anyway. So um, yeah. I went back into non league, you know, carried so, on playing. 
so as well as painting and decorating that you're doing now, you, you're also doing some really good charity stuff coming up, aren't you? Do you want to? Yeah, um, I've got involved. Well, uh, first of all, it started off. I got I got asked to play in a charity game, um, which fingers crossed will be next May, and it's a uh, it's a Fleetwood Town. Obviously, I'm up in the northwest. It's it's a Fleetwood Town uh, eleven against uh, a, cha a Legends Charity eleven. So there's there's quite a few ex players playing from from different walks of life. Um, there's you know, people like Brett Ormer or people like that are, are, are going to play in it. There's quite a few of that type of uh, my era type of players, uh, quite a lot of TV stars. Uh, and then from that, um, a whole new ball game started. So, so F FC, I've got to remember the name of it now because my brain's fuddled at my age now. I've added that many balls. <laughs> um, it's it's an FC charity squad basically, and the the concept is that we will we will play two to three four games around Britain uh, for charity for different charities. So I was asked uh, very kindly if I'd become manager. Um, maybe they think my playing days are over. Um, we shall see. So I, I after a little bit of thought, and it didn't take me that long. I thought, yeah, I fancy, I fancy some of that. Um, I think it, it it will be somewhat nice to get involved in. Um, so the, there's there's different charities involved. My my mum bless her uh, suffers with dementia, so I was asked uh, which charity would I want to support. So obviously, uh, Dementia UK, and then uh, part of it is the. Uh, do you remember uh, the soldier that was killed in London, Lee Ryan? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, Lee's parents live in uh, Fleetwood. Uh, so they're part of it for the Lee Ryan Foundation. Um, so there's there's some very meaningful charities involved in it. Um, I'll tell you who else is, is, is part of it. He's president of it. Um, uh, have you seen the, the, the charity fella that goes around in his swimming shorts, the Everton fella? Have you never seen uh, him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Another Speed one you mean. Speedo Mick, Speedo Mick. Speedo Mick. Well, Speedo yeah. Mick's our president. <laughs> right. So, so we, we've got a, 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 a real broad horizon of people involved. Yeah. Um, and the concept all came up through these, uh, the, the lads, the supporters at Fleetwood, who decided they want to put this game on. And from there, it just snowballed. And we've got sponsorships galore. We've got, uh, we've already uh, got a game uh, organised, we're going up to Scotland to play Rangers mm -hmm. uh, to play their Legends team we are looking at playing a, a Midlands 11 team Wolverhampton Wanderers have already been on to us about playing their, their Legends team um, and we will we will look to play as, as, as many as we can really um, obviously people have got jobs, people are doing this, doing that so you can't have too many in a season but you know, if we can get three or four in per season, um, it should be good. It should well, be. We'll, we'll definitely get you down south, Sean, and we'll we'll put a podcast eleven up against you. I think, don't you, Neil? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to yeah. say, if you, if, you, if you do become manager, it'd be nice for you not to have a manager to fall out with. <laughs> hey, listen, I might fall out with myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I you see, I was different. You see, I did become a manager. Um, <laughs> obviously, uh, in non-league, I, I took a, a club called Berska. Um, to the FA Trophy final and won the final in, in 2003. Uh, and when I took the job, the one thing, I, the one thing, I, I upset the board straight away because I sort of said to the secretary, um, well, I make the decisions now, not you. So I decide what we're doing, where we're staying, where we're having pre-match, blah, blah, blah. Um, they sat me five weeks after we won the trophy. <laughs> <laughs> A difference of opinion. <laughs> so... You know, it followed me into management as well. I gave up then. I couldn't be bothered after that. <laughs> so, so, Sean, you say you're you're painting and decorating. You're in the northwest, and I've got oh. to ask it. But are you also selling teddy bears for a living? I'm just looking at what's behind you. you no, know, these these are my these are my wife's collection of Harrods bears. So every year she buys a teddy bear from Harrods. So they're all they're all named, and they've all got a year date on their foot, um, <laughs> and. Uh, we just need a bigger room. 
a bigger room. Well, it's been brilliant talking with you. Thanks so much for for spending the time with us. It's been been a lot of fun, and, and you know we remember you fondly at Bournemouth, even though it was only two and a bit seasons. Um, you were in part very, of a great side. That's very kind of you to say, Jeff. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Cheers, Neil. Thanks very much. Take and care. Thank you, Neil. Been great having you too. Um, no, I loved, it. loved every minute of it. Great to reminisce always. Excellent. And uh, fans out there, we're going to wrap up this show, but um, stay tuned on the channel. We've got some more very interesting interviews to come. And uh, watch this space. They'll be they'll be pretty um, pretty explosive, I'd say. So check those out. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Give us a like. Get in touch. Be part of the podcast community. And we'll see you on the next show.